This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 271 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Benefab Products, TotalSaddleFit.com, and Easy Signs Online. This is Reese Koffler Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. This is Philip Parks from Fergus, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show with our producer, Glenn. Hey, guys. Welcome back. Hi. How are you guys tonight? It's good to have you guys back. Uh, you had a little week off for the para, para to talk uh, WEG, and, uh, it's, it, and of course, we're all going to be talking WEG here in a couple of weeks. I Things know, are it's heating coming, up. Eh? Yeah, it's coming so quickly. We will have some live reports from there. I have a couple of people standing by to uh, give us live reports and, and about dressage. So we'll, we'll have that on the show as, as we get closer and closer to the date. I know. I wish I was there. Big frowny face. <laughs> yeah. Can, can the show send us there? We yeah. would love to do a live report. Hey, I'll tell you what we'll do. In, <laughs> in okay. uh, 2018, we'll send you to Canada, Philip. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All the way to the Great White North. <laughs> All the way to the Great White North. I hear it's nice in the, in the summer. Yeah, yeah. Philip. What's the weather like in October in Canada anyway? We, oh. we, I, know, um, I need to know in, how to pack. In Quebec, it can be cold. Yeah? It, it can snow in October. Really? Yeah, I did for my wedding, remember? Oh, it did. It, it snowed so much for Philip's wedding, I wasn't sure we could get there. But I'm from the south. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. I'm like, Travis, yeah, there's a, a lot of snow on the wet, on the road. And Travis is like, it's Canada, Reese. There's, it's not snow. <laughs> well, well, that's crazy. Now you're I, talking me it, out of it, Philip. You, you guys are going to have to go cover it for us because that's way too cold okay. for us Florida people. Oh, okay, but we can handle True. it. We can handle it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Very. Hey, I got an announcement to make here at the very beginning of the show. Yay! A little housekeeping. First of all, don't forget about our app. It's the easiest way to listen to the show, iOS or Android. Go to the App Store on your phone and search for Horse Radio Network. The Dressage Radio Show is one of the 10 shows on there that you can take a listen to, either streaming or download it to your phone. It just makes it so simple and so easy, so do that. And the second thing is we're having a, we're having a party. Yay. Uh, we're having a live party on August the 20th, and I think it turns out that you two are going to be together. So yeah. possible. Yeah. It's so possible. That's, that's, yeah. The, that's in, the rumor. Philip might be in Lexington, <laughs> maybe. We're, we're keeping our fingers crossed. But uh, Helena and I are hosting a live uh, a, a virtual party that night because it's our anniversary. It is Aww. actually today, as we speak, is the six-year anniversary of the Horse Radio Network, the first Stable Scoop radio show. Episode number one went out on August the 8th of 2008. So it's our sixth year. Yeah, yeah our, that's awesome. Yep, so, so today is our anniversary. We're very excited about that. And uh, the whole network put together, we're over 3,500 episodes now with over 5,000 guests we've interviewed out of the horse world. Um, crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we uh, we're gonna have a little party. It's a, we're gonna be live. Helena and I are hosting it. You guys are gonna call in. The other hosts are gonna call in. Listeners are gonna call in. Past guests are gonna call in. So we're just there's no plan. We are just uh, taking the calls as they come, and we're just gonna have some fun. We're gonna and wing it. We're gonna wing it. And then after I love it. after that night, that episode uh, will be put out on all the feeds. So it'll also go out in the dressage feed. So anybody that wants to can take a listen. Awesome. To our anniversary party. So that's coming up I'm on excited. the 20th. Yeah. So if anybody wants to speak to Reese or Philip, uh, we'll get, as we get closer, we'll post on the Facebook page exactly what time you guys are going to join us. And then uh, people can call in and talk to you guys as well. Fabulous. Sounds Love like it. Fun. <laughs> a good time and have alcoholic beverages ready we can't provide them for you it's kind of a bring your own bottle uh, so. <laughs> no Makes problem sense. that's that's <laughs> my kind of party that is my kind of party you know i couldn't figure out how to do it otherwise so yeah i guess we'll have to stick with that yeah i love it i love it Very that's cool. like fun. well we're looking forward to it congratulations again that's awesome yeah a lot of fun very cool. Well, well Philip, I guess. What's, well, what's going yeah. What's going on in the news, Reese? I mean, we've been off for a couple of weeks, hanging out. I what know. What have you been up to? 
Well, I have to be honest. I went uh, on vacation for a week with my family, um, and that was lots and lots of fun. Um, it's you know to fly a kite with a four year old little boy is really entertaining. Uh, you know, you forget all these little things and going to the beach and uh, jumping waves, and we just had a big time. It was really fun, and um, so I was gone for a week, and you know everything kept marching along here, which was pretty cool. And uh, I'm back riding after my surgery, so that's pretty. Pretty, that's pretty fun. Um, and actually, I was I was so missing it. And, the, and when I first got back on, it was like, oh, this is where I belong. So that was really fun. So who was uh, the first are, horse? Who was the first horse? Who do you think it was, Philip? Denali. It was my Denali. Of course, it was my Denali. Um, I rode him. I actually had, had went to Texas uh, to try some horses, and I didn't tell my doctor. Uh, so I actually did ride a little bit before I was supposed to. Oops. Before um, you got cleared. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I had to break the rules a little bit about riding as we all are terrible patients as, as riders. Um, and it's like, when can we get back on the horse? And I, I had already scheduled this trip so to look for horses for a client. So I had ridden a little bit. So I actually rode Denali um, the night before I left because I thought, oh, I have to at least sit on the horse a little bit before I go. So, of course, it was my sweet Denali. So um, that was pretty awesome. So I uh, rode him and, and back to work now and um, – it's just bustling around here. We're uh, going to start showing again next week. Uh, we had we take a little break in the middle of the summer. I know it's a little different from you, Philip. Um, yeah. But it's so hot here, and we have young riders, and usually July is 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 busy with other things, and and I don't typically show in July. I will sometimes, but you know it's just so hot uh, here. So <laughs> uh, we take the and then start showing at the end of August. So we start showing again next week, and then it is crazy till November. So. Uh, I did did enjoy a little holiday for sure. So, how about you, Philip? Um, I was just thinking about that, you know, and I, I was like, well, it's just been busy with riding and stuff. I can't remember <laughs> um, specifically the- what I've been doing, but it's you know, it seems like horse shows every weekend and and lessons and and schooling and and fun and and so that's been about it. We have kind of the the last big show of the year. Uh, we'll wrap up next was it next week yeah next weekend so we're just planning on that and then uh and then there's there's some more stuff going on but but not for you know not for kind of the professional showing series sort of thing so you know that's about it you know we're thinking summer's gonna be over soon and uh we're thinking about other things so uh it's pretty crazy pretty crazy you know like i said before you know we get our three or four months and we just go 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 and that's what it feels like it's it's been and uh, it's exhausting, but uh, you know, September it'll all be done. Everybody, you know, kids will be back to school and all that. So uh, we got to take advantage of the time as it is now when the weather's been beautiful and awesome and uh, horses are going really well. And uh, wish us luck at the, at the show next week. Yes, definitely. Yeah, we've also actually had a really nice summer. Uh, I think, um, I don't know how the rest of the country is, but here uh, in this area, it's been beautiful. Not super hot. I mean, it was like 80 degrees today, um, which is not, you know, sometimes it can be 100 in August here and uh, a little actually cool in the morning. So yeah. very, yeah. very cool. Well, Philip, what's going on in the news? Well, the uh, World Championships for Young for young Dressage Horses is on at the moment. So I think they had their first day of competition today. And um, I guess the news from that is that uh, the Danish Stallion Szechuan, written by Dorothy Schneider, Olympic German Olympic rider, wins the, the World Young Horse five-year-old qualifier. So it's not the finals or anything, but it's, but it's the first test that these young horses are performing at the World Championships. And... Uh, and Szechuan is a winner. He coming into this competition, he was really highly ranked. They thought he would win, and um, this horse has been on the internet a lot, you know, since since he was three or four years old. I mean, we've seen him. He was part owned by Andreas Helgstrand until earlier this year. Um, it's a stallion, um, really fantastic horse, dark horse, kind of kind of got the totalist look going on. Big dark horse, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. He is by uh, Blue Horse Zach, and uh, and out of a mare by uh, Don Shufro. So, wow. dressage bloodlines out the wazoo. Um, Zach was actually a, a, a Dutch stallion. I think they bought him. They bought him. Um, Blue Horse bought him as a very young horse at the at the auction. So, um, 
Fantastic. He had a mark of 10 for the canter and a final score of 9.68, which is Ooh. kind of mind blowing. That's yeah, pretty, out of 10. pretty close to perfect, I mean, you know? Yeah. And Ooh. a 10 for canter. Yeah. I mean, uh, I know that Florencio got a 10 for his canter. I can't think of how many other horses have, but not that many get 10s, you know? So, awesome. um, pretty fantastic. Awesome. So it's exciting. Young horses, right? I know. We both enjoy the young horses, and it's lots of fun. We have a lot around my barn right now, so it's like Young Horse Alley. So, um, yeah, <laughs> check, out, check out the videos. Check out the videos yeah. and see what they're supposed yeah, to be I'm doing. Yeah, right? I'm going to. Yeah, I'm yeah, not with mine I've been doing. So, I <laughs> love it. Love it. Well, uh, also. No, there's been some, there's been, there's been some other news coming out. What, what else we got here? Yeah, so Courtney King Dye, who's a friend of ours and, and been on the show many times, uh, is proud to announce that her publication, her autobiography, Courtney's Quest, a heart-wrenching depiction of what it's like to strive for the Olympics, make them, and fight for her life. Um, and this this book, it was released on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon.com. And so many people have been talking about that literally it's hard for them to hold back tears um, while they're, um, reading the book and, and Courtney did go to the Olympics and she also, um, she had a seven per, a 7% survival rate after her accident where she, uh, her horse tripped and she was not wearing a helmet and she's come back and she's now a mom of a beautiful, beautiful baby girl. And, um, so I can't wait to read this book because she truly is an inspiration to all of our, to all of us. So, um, it should be really fun. But again, it's called Courtney's Quest and it's available on Amazon.com and it's published uh, by Words, uh, Words in the Works, in Panama, New York. So it should be a really, really good one. So um, please, if anybody reads it, um, feel free to send us uh, by email or on the Facebook page a review. We'd love to hear what you think about the book. So very, very fun. Oh, that's awesome. I remember talking to her not too long ago about, about right. her book coming out. She was so excited and and uh, yeah, I got to pick it up. Exactly. Well, great. Well, Philip, tell us a little bit about who's on the show today. Uh, we have David Ziegler, who was at the uh, North American Young Riders Championships. He he's actually pretty inspirational himself. He he medaled in the eventing championship at Young Riders, gold medal, and silver medal at the individual dressage. Two two different horses, but pretty pretty awesome. You know, he qualified two horses for you know in in the different disciplines and uh, and medaled in both. I think it's the first time somebody's uh, somebody's ever medaled in both before. So right. Um, Pretty exciting. Yeah. yeah. Great guy. Really nice guy. And then we have uh, Justin Bagty, who is from totalsaddlefit.com. We've got him on to answer some uh, listener questions and some frequently asked questions about saddle fit and stuff. So uh, he's, uh, he's been on the show before. They're a great sponsor of the show. And he's a great guy for answering saddle questions. So, uh, you know, sounds like a, it's going to be a great show. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to a trainer tip. We're going to answer a listener email later on in the show. So, so sounds Excellent. pretty good. So yeah. right after this commercial break, we'll um, head on with David's interview. Easy Signs Online is the official sign company of the Horse Radio Network. This week's product highlight are their personalized nameplates. Perfect for horse stalls, tack rooms, lockers, bedroom doors, dog kennels, or whatever you can think of. Choose from hundreds of online graphics to further customize the nameplates from EasySignsOnline.com. Made from one half inch thick, solid PVC signboard, these colorful and unique one-sided nameplates are three and a half inches by 16 inches and are designed for durability, long-term indoor or outdoor use. They are only $39.95 each, and remember, free shipping on most orders over $100. Visit them at EasySignsOnline.com. Well, it is my pleasure tonight to have David Ziegler, who was a, a medalist at the North American Young Rider Championships in both eventing and dressage, and we are pretty sure he's the first one to ever do that. And just for Philip, he is also Canadian. So, David, welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi, guys. Great to be here. Well, congratulations on quite a week. Yes, it, um, I'm still having quite haven't quite wrapped my head around it. <laughs> I keep I walking past the medals in my room. I'm like, where did those come from? <laughs> I think I would sleep with them, just personally. <laughs> I would just kind of cuddle them all night long. 
So congratulations. Oh, Reese, you'd sleep with anything. Uh, Philip, <laughs> I'm telling you, Philip, what is wrong with you tonight? I am blushing. <laughs> oh, so David, yeah. tell us Just first kidding. about your gold medal in the two star on cl- critical decision. Um, well, we picked up the lead right after dressage. So clearly my coaches have been doing something right. And we had a gorgeous cross country round. Um, and looks like a little equitation round out on the field. And then show jumping got a little dicey. Um, <laughs> we had some, we had some rider error um, going into one of the triples, but thank God we had that spread going into it. Cause we used up the three rails we had. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about who you're coached by. Um, Missy and Jessica Ranshausen. I have a mother daughter team. Um, they're based in Unionville, Pennsylvania, where I've been living the last three years and training with them. Excellent. And and they are very dear to our, to my heart personally. Uh, they were also my sister's coach and my coach through the years. So um, we love both and Jess and Missy. And I was uh, here when Missy actually rode the same horse at Rolex several years in a row. Oh, critical you? decision. Yeah. So he is he's a wonderful horse. Tell us a little bit about uh, BG or critical decision. Oh, BG is an absolutely one of a kind horse. I'm, I'm a little sad that I'm pretty sure I'm never going to find another one like yeah. him. Um, he just he has so much heart and so much love for the sport. And as soon as as soon as he unloaded him off the trailer in Kentucky, he just took a look around, and I swear he grew another hand and just beefed out. He knows his Kentucky, and he was there to own it. Excellent. So tell just for our listeners, tell us what a two star event means. Um, it's, or the Olympic level is a three star. So the two stars right below that. Um, so it's where the selectors will start looking at long listed riders, um, for potential Olympics. And I think the Pan Ams now are actually a two star. Right. It's big. And, and tell us your dressage test is kind of equivalent to what? I would say it's an easy second level. Got it. Got it. Um, and, but and then the, the jumps are about, the jumps are about meter 15, meter 20. Yeah. They're huge. I'm just going to say, <laughs> I looked at the, I looked at that course out there and I thought, no way, whatever. I could walk under a few of those bad boys. Well, so. I think it helps that I'm six, three and BG is <laughs> like 17 too. Cause I look at all the pictures and I don't want to buy any of them. So I'm like, these jumps look puny. <laughs> and they weren't, they were huge. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That is amazing. That's very cool. Well, well, just to be able to do that, I mean, I can barely go over cross rails, so I have all respect in the world for anybody that, that does that. So let's switch. Let's go to Peninsula Man, or you call him Topper, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, Peninsula Top Man. I've had him for six years now, and he actually, um, I had originally bought him as an event horse, but I took him up to the junior one-star level, but unfortunately he ended up being too much of a pansy when it came to jumping, and we made the transition over to dressage while we were here I'm, training with Missy. I'm just going to add in, I think he's intelligent. I think I, I would be with him, with Topper. I'd be like, no way, I'm not doing that. Oh, so I think Topper is I, adorably cute and smart. I'm just going to say. I don't think he realized how difficult upper-level dressage was. I thought he... He thought dressage was his prelim eventing test, you know, first level, <laughs> easy for life, but <laughs> he was mistaken. The flying changes were quite a battle for the last two years. Yeah. So what was it like to transition him from being an event horse to now an upper level dressage horse? He has a bit of that Irish belligerent. <laughs> he doesn't like being told what to do. So definitely we had to be a little bit tactful. Um, training him but thankfully he's had such a good hind end and collected compression work has definitely been his strongest point um all through his life so when it came to doing the pirouettes that was quite quite easy to train um whereas the chain or the flying change is always having to change my leg aids he we took that took a long time um i would say it was only um only April or May that we really had them confirmed because going in when we were qualifying in Wellington in January, it was 
you know, fingers crossed and hold your breath when we got to the fourth and the three is because we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I've had a few of those. Philip, how about you? All the time. I haven't had anything else. That's all I got. <laughs> so, David, is it safe to assume that the, the dressage phase of the eventing is, is, is your go-to? That's your favorite part of, of doing the eventing? Or I mean, I, I honestly, how much do you like doing the jumping? Well, it depends on the horse. <laughs> um, his BG is really, um, he's a little bit nervous in the dressage. So I would say the dressage isn't my favorite on him. The cross country definitely is because he just gets out on course and he pulls me around and just drags me to every fence. But with Topper, it was the dressage was the easiest. So it was the most fun, whereas I was swearing and kicking him at every fence on the cross country. So <laughs> breaking my jumping bath along the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, goodness. And and so this year, how much time did you spend, you know, eventing and going to those competitions versus, you know, qualifying in, in the dressage ones? I spent about three weeks um, in Wellington in January. I ran the first three CDIs at Global and we got our qualifying scores there. And then as soon as I was done that, I hopped up to Ocala and um, spent February, March, April, May qualifying for the eventing just since the competitions are so spread out um we ended up we had our first qualifying score in march in north carolina and then we got our second one in may in new jersey awesome so david what's what's the next step for you we just declared for pan ams from the dressage horse um, he ran his first I won yesterday and he won it with a 68%. And Excellent. there's definitely, there was room for improvement in the test. So it's great knowing that the scores can only go higher um, unless, you know, <laughs> knock on wood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we always have our fingers um, crossed when you make that statement. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, BG critical decision is actually now retired. So he's professional hack pony around the farm for me. I, I, when can I be professional hack pony? That's what I want to do for sure. I'm like, I want that job. Awesome. And what about your life? Like after being a double medalist, how, how has this sort of changed? Have things settled down for you at all? Um, no, they haven't thankfully. <laughs> Cause, um, a few days or once I got back from young riders, the horses had about three days off and I was just kind of sitting around twiddling my thumbs and like, this isn't okay. I need a new goal. So <laughs> copper. Topper got cut short his vacation. I'm like, we're just going to go for the I1 next week. <laughs> Lovely. I love it. Um, and then I have a young event horse who some clients at the farm own, and he was back at their farm while I was at Young Riders just having a break. And Joan came over to the farm to congratulate me. And before I even really let her speak, I was like, you need to bring Chester back. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh. <laughs> that's great that's awesome well it's david been the last three years have been focused on young riders young riders training up for it so sure <laughs> and, and now that pan am has given me another yeah that's an awesome goal that's my event horse. very cool well david thank you so much for coming on the show tonight and we hope we can talk to you again on your trip to the pan am games for sure and if any of our listeners want to get a hold of you online how can they do that Oh, my Facebook has been blowing up. <laughs> so, <laughs> Excellent. I know. Um, I, I'm a friend now. <laughs> I think at the moment, Facebook's the, the easiest way to get in touch with me. Great. Well, thanks so much. And we wish you luck on your next journey. Great. Thank you. It's been great here. Hello, Robin Donahue here, and I'm an official HRN auditor. I love the programming that the Horse Radio Network offers and have chosen to support them through a monthly contribution. If you enjoy listening to any of the Horse Radio Network shows, won't you join us as a member of the HRN Auditor family? You can do it for as little as a dollar a month. Just go to horseradionetwork.com and click on the HRN Auditor banner. And don't forget, as an auditor, we get the blooper reel. 
Well, Justin from Total Saddle Fit is back uh, this week by popular demand. Everyone loved his segment we had on a couple weeks ago. And he's going to ask a, answer a few more frequently asked questions about saddle fit. So I hope you enjoy. This week's dressage training tip is brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, home of the shoulder relief girth at totalsaddlefit.com. Well, it's great to have Justin from totalsaddlefit.com on the show today to answer some listener questions and to talk saddle fit. Seems to be a topic that everybody is really, uh, really interested in. So, Justin, welcome to the show again. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm really thrilled to be back on. Awesome. So we were talking. Uh, it was maybe two or three weeks ago about you know your saddle. Well, your your great girth, the total relief girth that uh, that you guys produce, and which uh, you know the uh, the listeners were interested in. And so we got a couple of questions for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. The first one is is pretty pretty related to uh, to the total relief girth. Here is how to how to measure the girth best fit for your horse. All right. Well. This applies to the shoulder relief girth and pretty much any other girth out there. So we won't play favorites. We'll, we'll apply this to everything. And there's a couple things to, to factor in. Because with girth, you can really have a huge swing in the sizing and still technically make it attach a saddle to a horse. But ideally, the first thing we want to look at, or the, sort of the first way that we want to err, is in the direction of length. And the... The, the, it's generally better to err on the long side for a, for a handful of reasons. One, it's better weight distribution over the surface of the girth. So, you know, if you're putting, no matter how you look at it, you're going to put a little pressure on your horse when you're attaching your saddle, so might as well disperse that pressure the most you can. Uh, second, the uh, you don't want it to be too short because the buckles might run into the horse's elbow. So we want to keep that out of the way. And then thirdly, the horse's pectoral muscles run kind of in that lower area where a short girth might be. So we don't want the edge of our girth to be resting on our pectoral muscles and risk any kind of, you know, like pressure point there. So we err on the longer side, which that ends up being like a kind of a ballpark, you know, four to six inches from the bottom of the saddle flap from the end of the girth tends to be a pretty good sweet spot. Okay, excellent. And the the next question is related to our last interview, but... Uh, we talked about tips uh, about a balanced saddle. The listener was at, was was taught that lo- the lowest part of the saddle seat should be parallel with the horse's back. W- would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, and you know what what we spoke about last time. I think the way that I explained it was a ballpark sort of rule of thumb would be that the pommel and the cantle would be level. And when the listener wrote in and said, "Well, I thought it was the lowest point in the seat," ultimately we're saying the same thing. You know, we're, we're looking for that center, you know, more or less center balance and levelness for that even weight distribution. So the, the low point in the seat's a great rule of thumb to use as well. I just find visually, if you look, if you try to look at it, you know, pommel to cantle, it's a little easier to see. Excellent. Excellent. Now, Reese, did you come up with some questions maybe today about I did. asking around so, the barn a little bit? Yeah, I, it was a big topic around the barn that you were coming in. And I said, okay, everybody, what are your saddle fitting questions. And one of the questions that came up was how often should you have your saddle reflocked? Ah, uh, that is a good question. And I wish I had a perfect answer for you, but the fact of it is it depends. Now, if we're going to go with a really big, kind of like a ballpark, yeah, I'd say every three to nine months. And if we're going to like an average would be about every six months, but it's going to vary from horse to horse and rider to rider. The main things that make it fluctuate is usually, well, first off, how much you ride. Because, um, you know, some people can ride 10 times in six months. Some people can ride, you know, 100 times or more probably. But a, a, horse, a horse that might have like a, maybe a thoroughbred that's got, you know, narrow, high weather, they're usually going to break a saddle in quicker or rather even break down the wool in the saddle much more quickly because of the horse's conformation. Now, if you have a broader horse and – Mind you, I'm sort of speaking in general generalities here, but you have a broader horse, the, they'll carry the saddle a little bit better so it doesn't break down quite as quickly. So that that can sort of give you a general idea. You, you know, 
your more narrow kind of horses usually are a little bit more frequent, and the broader horses are a little bit less frequent. Um, but it's hard to give an exact answer. So if if I if you held a gun to me, I'd say every six months. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that that's realistic. I mean, you know, it's hard. Like here in Kentucky, we get quite a bit of, you know, spring and fall, we have saddle fitters that come in for the horse show. So it works out pretty well for me. I, but I know, um, you know, I have students that live in the middle of, you know, Kansas or wherever, and it's hard to get a saddle fit. So I think that that's a good kind of generality every, every six months, maybe twice a year, if you're riding a lot. I like that. Totally. So, and that's, so, you know, kind of taking it back to, uh, to the balance thing that we were talking about a few weeks ago and just a minute ago. That's a really good tell. If your saddle starts, if your saddle was balanced and it starts kind of going askew one way or the other, that's a really good time when, you know, even if it might still feel comfortable for you, that's a great uh, little, little tell to let you know that probably it's time to, if not get a flock, at least get it checked. That makes sense. So, so, you know, all of us, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, and I try not to, I try to check the saddles as much as I can. Um, you know, when you're putting your saddle on your horse, how often should you, should you be really critical about the saddle fit? Like really Um, look at the balance. You know, some of us, we we're we're tired after work or you get on another horse and you don't really pay attention, but what's a good thing, good way to tell your, you know, every six, every six weeks. I mean, should you mark it on your calendar the first of the month? Look at your saddle. Is, is there something like that that people can think about? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question because, honestly, if you check it every single day, you probably won't notice any any changes because it's, you know, it's like if, if, if you've ever tried to lose weight, if, you're, if, you, if you step on the <laughs> scale every, every six hours, you know what, you're going to be pretty, you're not going to notice a change, you know, from, from day to day. So I think, making sure you have enough time in between checks once a month, I think would be a great frequency to really give it a good, a good look. And I'll even add a little bit additional to that, which is check it with no pads underneath. And that's not to say that you'd ride without pads, but just girth the saddle up, girth it up tight as if you were going to ride with no pads. And that'll give you a much clearer idea of what's going on. Um, you know, pads can, can sometimes can mask things that are going on. And sometimes pads can be used to correct saddle fit. Let's get a very pure view of what's going on. Check it with no pads, girthed up tight. And 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 that, I guess that that brings kind of another question for me. You know, when we do saddle fitting, we typically ride without the saddle pad if the horse can handle it. I've had a couple that that can't, but you know, we typically ride without the saddle pad to check kind of the dust marks of the saddle. Is that something yeah. to do when you do that check? Yeah, that is good. You know, dust marks and, and, and even sweat marks to some extent can occasionally, you know, be a little bit misleading because there's so much left up to, you know, interpretation, like a sort of u- user interpretation, potentially user error. So if, if someone is educated and knows what they're looking for, I think that's definitely helpful. And even, what, you know, whether, whether someone knows much about battles that or not, if you have a suspicion, checking something like, sweat marks or dust marks can really con- help you either, you know, confirm or disprove what you might be, you know, what you might be thinking is going on. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause that's, I, that's how I know that, that we do it. And, and I've, I've tried to be really, I try to really look once, when our guys are here and, and checking. So no, that, that's a really good idea. So on another kind of topic, this was at the barn talk today. You know, you hear a lot, and, and not talking about brands of saddles, but you hear a lot about saddles that are kind of foam, or you hear wool, or can you talk a little bit about the difference in, in like a wool flock saddle to a memory foam saddle? You know, I know there's a new memory foam out. You know, how, how do you kind of differentiate when you go to buy a saddle? Uh, it, it's kind of confusing to know. Yeah, air, what air it, was a big thing not too long air, ago. Air, you know, it yeah. Like, I, it went. Uh, yeah. seems very trendy. Yeah. How do you, how do you know? Yeah. Well, this is a bit of a contentious topic, depending oh. on who you're talking to. Who, who you're <laughs> Sorry. Talking, Way to ask who you're the tough to. questions. No, no, no. I think this is a, it's a really great question. But the reason I say it's a contentious topic is because it all depends who you're talking to and what they're trying to sell you. Yeah, first exactly. And foremost. That's always the case. Right, exactly. That's um, why I asked you. Because <laughs> it's like, so, wait a minute, that's very confusing. It, what I find is a, is a nice little little sort of check and balance on this whole debate is what happens when you talk to independent saddle fitters that are not selling, they're not representing any saddle brand. It's more about what are they 
like, you know, the, the independent saddle fitters that go around and do a lot more adjustments and fit checks as opposed to saddle sales. And they, without doubt, always err toward wool. And I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the wool camp as well. The reason being uh, a couple things. One, it, it, wool is it's just a bunch of little particles. So it, the way it breaks in and settles to a horse's back, it has like a sort of a molding effect. It can really, over time, it, it's, it's a natural fiber and it molds to your horse's back. So that's the first benefit of wool. The second is that it, you can fine tune it and adjust it over the life of the saddle. You know, it's like a, like a car where you're changing the oil to make sure the engine's always running properly. It's kind of the same concept. Your horse is never going to stay the same shape, you know, from, from now until six months from now until six months from then. He's always going to be changing, whether it's muscling or, you know, climate, you know, climate changes, winter to, to summer kind of stuff. So you want to keep up on that and make sure that the weight distribution, the balance, all of that's on point. And the wool really helps you do it because you can make little tweaks here and there. Now, I don't want to totally discredit foam and say, oh, it's the worst stuff ever. If you get a memory foam saddle that happens to fit the shape of your horse's top line, the width of the spine, the balance and everything really, really well, then that can work as well. It's just the, in practice, it's so rare that you can check every little box with the foam, pa- foam panel saddles just because you, they, come from the, they come from the factory with one you know, relatively rigid shape. And then you have to work with that. You can you can do some shin padding and stuff, which is helpful, but the wool just gives you a lot of flexibility. Yeah, that makes sense. I, you know, it's funny. I it just in anything, even you know, there are fancy stirrups out there, and I'm sort of a, a, an old school soul, I guess. It's like I've always had a wool saddle. I've always had basic stirrup and leather. You know, irons. I you know, I'm, I'm weird about that kind of stuff, so I'm always a little leery myself. And, and I've had, you know, I, you know, I have somebody come in every six months for the saddles and, and are able to adjust it with the wool. So I think I'm, I guess I'm old school. So I don't know hundred percent. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of old school, I guess. So no, that's, that really makes sense. Cause that's a big one when you go to try saddles. Um, and I'd love to hear your opinion. Cause so, you know, a lot of times, and, and we're lucky at least here in Lexington that we have Rolex every year. And yeah. I typically tell my, my students, you know, okay, if they're looking for a new saddle, you know, I, I try to say, try to say, try to wait till April where you can go and sit in a lot of saddles. Um, and then, you know, again, we're lucky enough. Typically we can get people to come out after the show or, or, or whatever to come fit the horses here on the property. But if you don't have an, like, what, what do you tell someone, you know, how, how do you, if you're in the middle of nowhere and don't have a Rolex to go to, how do you tell people to sort of even start the process of buying a saddle? Oh boy, that's a tough one. Now, I know. Sorry. I'm getting, I'm know, getting the, good ones in. <laughs> yeah. No, these are really good questions. The fact that they're tough means that they're good. Um, <laughs> you know, it, you kind of go back, at least in my opinion, I think with that, you, you take it back to the, the basics the most you can, which is first, speaking of you know, referencing our last question, I'd say in that case, for sure, getting a wool panel saddle would be a huge benefit because even if you miss the mark a little bit as, a, as an amateur trying to make do with whatever saddle you know you can buy on the internet or, or in a tax store or something, at least you have a bunch of flexibility in adjusting it and tweaking it once you own it. So let's just say you got it and it was pretty close, but wasn't quite right. With pictures and email, you can ma- you can always mail a saddle out to saddle fitters and saddle makers on either coast or in the center of the country. They're, they're all over the place. So maybe you live in the boonies, but a two-day UPS trip will get you, we'll, we'll send your saddle to someone who can adjust it if need be, and we'll, we'll, we'll let you do it. Um, the other thing would be, you know, sort of we're making it a little bit personal for one second. We have a saddle fit bike. Um, we, we offer free saddle fit advice for anybody who mails in to us. But um, the other thing would just be making sure you're comfortable. So first off, making sure any saddle that you purchase, you can get a demo period on it. You know, anything that you find online usually has like a seven or 10 day demo period so you can get it, make sure you're comfortable. And then when you go and check it, you know, have, some, have a friend take a picture, make sure the saddle's sitting level on your horse, run your hand underneath anywhere where the tree is, so the front saddle, the front of the saddle, and underneath the panels to make sure you don't feel any, like, over-the-top acute pressure points. 
just some kind of basic pointers, but, um, you know, with the wool, you'll have the flexibility, and at least with the trial period, you won't be stuck getting something, you know, kind of on a whim. That yeah, makes that's sense. A, that's a really tough problem, you know. Somebody's, especially if they're buying their first saddle or something. I never know what to tell people, so I just, I tell yeah, them to go. Really out. I always just tell them go out and sit in a hundred saddles and and try and figure it out, and and we get somebody that out. Is, that. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have the resources, it makes it really, really tough. Yeah, it's hard. I don't know what I would well, do. Well, sure, and then you factor in budget too. Is, is oh, someone's yeah. budget five hundred dollars sure. or five thousand dollars or somewhere in between, and that's going to either limit or open the doors to huge, you know, a huge variation in what you even have available as options, you know, and then sadly, sometimes, you know, we have to kind of make do with things that maybe aren't exactly perfect, but that's where creative pack comes in, you know, shimming pads and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and I guess sort of my last question for tonight is, you know, I hear people say, well, I'm really uncomfortable with a saddle, but it fits my horse really well. Um, you know, and, and I'd love your opinion because in my opinion, you know, there's so many saddles now out. Is it possible yeah, to find one yeah, where can't you're you find something that fits yeah. everybody, right? Yeah. Is it possible oh, to find absolutely. something, you know, I guess, I, you know, what, do you, what would you say if, well, it fits my horse, but I'm really uncomfortable. What would you say to that person? Well, I mean, assuming you super, super restrained budget is not the issue we're talking about. Sure. Um, I would say, first off, kudos for making sure your horse is comfortable before you are, to be <laughs> sure. perfectly honest. Um, but, the, but in all seriousness and being able, you know, there's no doubt that you can find something that will make both of you comfortable. It might be, you know, if you, the current saddle fitter you work with doesn't necessarily have something available. It might be a little bit of, uh, of a journey that finally figuring out that one saddle. But... I'd say they're at a huge advantage, someone who has a saddle that fits their horse but not them, because they at least know what to look for on their horse. So once they can check that box, then it's just a matter of, you know, sitting in 10 different saddles and figuring out which one they're most comfortable in. Now, the, what, what I've seen a lot of is the other way around where a lot of brands will make saddles that are extremely comfortable for a rider. And, you know, sadly, the horse oftentimes will be a little bit of an afterthought. So you these riders sit in the saddle and they immediately just go, oh, my God, I feel great. And then it's like, well, this isn't really working for your horse. And he doesn't, you know, he can't, he can't speak to you nearly as well as, uh, as you could, you know, you could tell yourself. So at least they have that going. But, yeah, in general, it, is, um, it can be a lot of work to, to get that, you know, the right saddle for horse and rider fully figured out. Now, Justin, how like how important do you think it is to to um, have the trainer, you know, somebody that, that the that the rider is working with, help to evaluate saddles? I mean, because you know, well, this saddle is uncomfortable for me. Well, maybe you're not sitting on your butt, sort of thing. You know, like these position issues. Have you ever run across this kind of thing? Like, well, you're just not really sitting on the horse well. So, no, the the saddle can't help that. You know, how, when do you run into these issues? That's, that's a big one. And especially if you have anybody who's crossing over from another discipline to dressage, dressage saddles are not necessarily the most, um, you know, you know, like standard saddles to fit in. So people that are coming from hunters or something like that, they're maybe used to a little bit more of a closed hip angle. They can a lot of times have, you know, have quite a bit of a challenge adjusting to a dressage saddle. I think in those kind of cases, having a trainer help you is huge because, you need to know that this is the process. This is how we ride. This is how you're going to be effective. But it will take you some time to adjust. Um, and even in, with people that have some experience riding, same thing. You know, you, you need a trainer to teach you how to ride. And part of part of the equation is learning how to sit in your saddle correctly, making sure that you you know you are balanced and, and at least as well set up as you can. You know, a lot of times, frankly. As you guys, I'm sure, know and probably have personal experience doing it. Trainers are oftentimes the people that will point out saddle inadequacies for a rider and kind of get get the ball rolling on on fixing it and making it right. Yeah, no, I think that that's a great point. You know, I think that it is important. You know, we do, we actually do saddle fitting day and we kind of make it sort of a barn party because saddle fitting day takes a long time and sometimes 
the saddles are good. And then sometimes you're going to get on and off and, and it's going to be kind of a long day for everyone. So we just ended up having, we usually have a barbecue and, and kind of make it a whole barn event and everybody has a good time just so everybody knows, okay, it's going to be a, it, it's a, or can be a process for you. Definitely. But I, well, you, I, guys, I think, you guys have it. You guys have it done right. I I would like to be your saddle fitter. You know, yeah. burgers and beers are involved. I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Have much. a few beers, fit a few exactly. saddles. You know. <laughs> I didn't say alcohol, boys. I oh. just said a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I I think because it is a team effort. You know, again, you have somebody maybe that is new to the sport, and you know they need to. Uh, you know, your, your trainer is, it's, it's an all team effort. And I think it is really important to have a saddle fitter that you trust and that can work with everybody and everybody can work together. Um, because sometimes you guys can make some really small tweaks that can help position or, you know, if the saddle isn't level and you make it level, it's so much easier to sit correctly. So I think that that's a really great point and, and that that is it, it's a team effort. You got to yeah. have your trainer involved. The, the only thing that I was thinking is I like sometimes no saddle is going to fit your bad position, fix your bad position. Right? <laughs> it's only a saddle. It's only some leather and stuff. I mean, we've sure. always got to work to ride better. Yeah. Always blame the tag, yeah. Right. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. sure. I mean, oh, yeah. like for, I think a great example was I had a student come today and, and the saddle was sitting so far to the left and she's working. I mean, right now she's working on getting a saddle and, and, it's an, but the saddle she's using at the moment sits her way left. And I was like, you know, we've got to, again, I'm not a saddle fitter. No, that's what we call Justin. But, you know, I basically said, come on, we've got to put something under the left side of that saddle. And we just put a towel just, and it really made a huge difference for the moment as we're trying to work on getting saddles done. So I think that, you know, no, no, it didn't fix her position, but it certainly helped her being more level in the saddle. Um, Right. So, she probably would never have known that she was thinking to the left had it not been for your advice. Right. Exactly. And, and uh, so, again, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, a it's whole all team hand in hand, you... isn't it? Right. It takes a team. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, when, when you have saddle fitting problems, you know, saddle fitter is great. A little bit of training advice. You know, it all goes together. Veterinarian, you know, if we have a real bad problem and, and you got a, a saddle that hurts a horse's back. Then you got to have, you know, a trainer can say, hey, like this isn't right. Or a saddle fitter can say this. Let's bring the veterinarian. Let's bring a chiropractor in. We're always, you know, helping the horses and do the job that, you know, the best they can do it. And, and it does take a big, a big team. So, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So, Justin, tell us again, you, you have a great service and you, you, you talked about it briefly. But tell us again um, how the service that your company offers for people that do need a, a saddle resource. Well, it's pretty it's pretty um, open in that we just offer free saddle fitting advice. Um, and that is via the phone or email with pictures and that kind of thing. Um, you know, like what we were talking about earlier, not everybody has access to a saddle fitter, whether it's, you know, location based or budget based, or maybe a combination of the two. Um, we just want to give a little bit of, just kind of help, help out a little bit, give back and um, offer, you know, offer some saddle fitting advice from a company that's not trying to sell somebody a saddle. So we just, we'll just kind of tell the truth, love it or hate it, see what we can do to help and, and assess, you know, assess anybody's situation. Like, Hey, this is all, this is the saddle I have to make do with. How do you suggest I make it the best it can be? Or, you know, I've got these three saddles on trial from these different companies. Which one do you think looks best on my horse? There's all kinds of stuff we do. Um, actually I was just speaking with a woman, uh, two or three days ago who had been running into a ton of trouble with, uh, she was getting some advice from an on, from a, like an online saddle seller, and they kept sending her saddles that were wider and wider and wider based on her horse's measurements, except for the front of the saddle kept sinking farther and farther and farther down, and the horse kept moving worse and worse. So we just talked it through, and I just suggested, you know, maybe you have someone say, you know, sort of uh, do something a little bit different, ask them to send you something just a little bit more narrow than what they might recommend, and she got it, but. It, you know, that it totally changed how the horse worked and she ended up buying the saddle from the, from that same online person. It just happened to, they just kept happening to send them in the wrong size initially. Excellent. Excellent. So how, how do, um, how are listeners access your service? Oh, sure. Um, you can just send us an email at care, C-A-R-E, at totalsaddlefit.com. Um, you can also just go to totalsaddlefit.com and we have a contact section there if, uh, if, if that's a little bit easier to remember. 
Excellent. And there's also information on your awesome shoulder relief girth, which both Philip and I use all the time. And we highly recommend Every it. Every day. Great love girth. it. Yeah. yeah we love product. it. And my Denali is well, so you. much happier. Every day I put his girth on, he doesn't bite me anymore. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Well, Justin, as always, thank you so much for answering our saddle fitting questions. We have so many more to get to. So we would love to have you back on again. And um, if our listeners have any questions, please feel free to email Philip and I. And also you can get a hold of Justin. And we would love to help you in any way we can with all your saddle fitting uh, questions. So, Justin, well, thanks. thanks so much. Are you tired of treating your horse for soreness? Well, then be proactive. Benefab offers you and your horse a natural remedy to joint and muscle stiffness, inflammation, and circulatory deficiencies. Benefab offers a variety of innovative products, like saddle pads and polo wraps and quarter sheets for your horse, and socks and blankets for you. Simply ride in it or wear it and feel the difference Benefab's ceramic-infused products make. You can check them out online at BenefabProducts.com or you can call them toll-free at 855-957-8378. So Philip and I now are going to answer um, a listener question. So take it away, Philip. Okay, well, we got this email. It's a little bit of a long email, so I won't, I won't read, the, uh, read the entire thing, but hopefully I can get to the pertinent points here. Um, as a dressage rider, I really love the teaching of horsemen like Ray Hunt, Tom Dorrance, and Buck Brenneman. I find their peaceful training techniques completely aligned with the partnership in dressage. I often apply both concepts into my training, which works out really well. However, there is one point of debate for which I would like to seek your thoughts. It is in regard to bit placement in the horse's mouth. Um, in my dressage training, I have often been instructed the bit adjustment on the head stall sh- cheek pieces should create one to two wrinkles in the corners of the horse's mouth. I have never been given a reason, just merely instruction. However, in reading Ray, Tom, and Buck's, Buck's books, I have encountered the idea to drop the bit to relieve the pressure on the corners of the horse's mouth so that it sits gently in the corners, not creating any wrinkles, but also not so low as to hit the teeth. The logic for this is, is that the one to two wrinkle theory would create a constant pressure for the horse that he should would eventually have to ignore and tune out. Um, ultimately, the rider would have to create even more pressure on the reins and would to be any defeat any end sensis- sensitization and connection development. Um, where the yeah, I mean, I think that's basically the um, the idea here of this email. There's there's lots more, but I, I think people get the idea where we're at here with one and two one to two wrinkles create you know does create a little pressure on the, on the horse's mouth. And also when we're riding dressage, you, you should create a connection in which there will be some pressure on the, on the bars of the mouth continuously. You know, that's, that's the idea of, of connection. But to, to answer this question most simply is that I adjust the, the bit in the horse's mouth so he can't get the tongue over it, more or less, right? You know, yeah. if the bit's too low, the horse can, can, you know, at times just pop the tongue over and that can be very painful for the horse. So... I, I mean, uh, most simply, you know, I'm adjusting the bit so so that can't happen, right? Sure. And um, you know, that's about it for me. What like like Reese, let, talk a little to us a little bit about connection and how you know how we like the horse to take a little pressure in the mouth, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, connection is is a big is a big thing. You know, it's it's actually part of the scale of training. So, um, you know, typically as you are teaching a horse in dressage. Uh, and interestingly enough, I, I just purchased a horse this week. I bought a new horse, um, and he's a cute little guy, but he, he's been a jumper. So he doesn't really understand the idea that he has to keep his hind legs moving, and eventually the energy ends up in my hand. You know, he wants to back off the bit. Uh, which is typical for a jumper. He probably had a pretty strong bit in his mouth, so he wants to not really grab a hold. Um, And I tell my students, it's like, basically, let's hold hands. You know, I don't want to hold hands that you're ripping my arm off, and I don't want to hold hands that, um, like, if you feel like you're shaking your grandma's hand where you don't actually grab, 
any any connection. So there is a happy place that you always want to have with the horse and the rider. And the happy place starts actually in the hind legs. Anytime you feel something up front, typically there's an issue behind. Um, and that's really what we're talking about here is, is that is that when you engage the horse and when you ask them to go forward, um, you need to feel them actually take a little bit of hold of the bit. Uh, some horses obviously take way too much of a hold of the bit, which is uncomfortable for everybody. Um, and that's not what we want. But some horses don't take enough of that hold. So it's your as the rider of a dressage horse, you have to create that connection between the horse's hind leg, your seat, leg and hand, and the bit. And we talk a lot about pushing the horse up to the bit. And that's the idea is that the horse needs to accept the pressure. Obviously, you want to have a nice soft connection starting. Uh, connection really starts at your shoulder and then goes to your elbow, wrist to the bit. Um, you want to have a, a, a connection that's comfortable for your yourself and for the horse. So that's a little bit about it. So the bit placement is important um, that it's not too high. Obviously, if it's too high, I don't know if you've ever put a piece of metal into your mouth and pushed it up against your your lips. It, it can be painful. Uh, so obviously, we don't want that. And like Philip said, we don't want the bit too low in the horse's mouth because then they can get the tongue over, ne- over the top of it. Um, and if you've ever had that happen, that's never fun. It happens mostly in double bridles, can happen in a single snaffle. Um, but... Uh, sometimes you can change, uh, for example, especially in a double with a curb bit, you can adjust the curb bit a little higher, a little lower, depending on the horse. I've had some that prefer it lower in their mouth versus higher. Um, but it, it really is an issue. Um, and then, you know, we can go all into um, types of bits and pressure. It's it's a it's huge science. Um, and a lot of times, and I, I don't know about you, Philip, but I have a huge bit box because I like people to be able to try Sort of what's out there and what are some options for their horse? Yeah, and- I mean every every horse has a has a you know a different bit that they kind of prefer, and we try and sure. find something that makes that makes the horse the horse happy and comfortable, and exactly. and not and not backed off of the bit, right? You're not loose right. in your hands and not and not curling up with his nose towards his chest. So yeah, you want that horse. You want to feel as you're trotting around that, or cantering, or or less in the walk. You don't really get a great strong connection in the walk, but you want to feel them pull you around the ring a little bit. I yeah. think dressage is a little bit different. You know, we're talking about the sensitization. I have a hard time with that word. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Certain words I can't say, but um, with sensitivity of the horse's mouth, like dressage is different than some of the other disciplines where the bit is used to stop. Our, our goal is never to, never to pull back on the hands to stop the horse. So the horse doesn't have to be sensitive to the bit to to stop or to turn or anything. You know, every all that comes from seat and leg pushing this way and that way, and to stop. You know, from from pressure in the saddle and not from the hands. So I don't need a super sensitive horse that's going to stop or turn quickly when I do something with a bit. I just want a nice steady pressure. Keep riding that horse to that pressure. That's what creates the round neck and the round back pushing towards that pressure and taking that and accepting it. And then, you know, I can, I can do tons of other things to, to, to turn or to, to, uh, to, you know, to put the brakes on if, if you need to. So uh, you don't want the horse so sensitive that as soon as you just have a little tiny pressure on the mouth that they stop or start going backwards. That's I never train a horse like that. That's, that's completely incorrect. So, um, hopefully that kind of idea helps helps uh, with this listener question that you know that um, yes the horse does, does isn't as sensitive to the mouth in dressage as, as I've seen them in in, uh, in some of the um, western riding and and the um, and the reining classes right I mean when they touch it I mean the horse really reacts and, and and that's a little bit different thing but but we're riding for connection and, and the horse to be comfortable with taking a little bit of a hold that sound about right, about right there Reese yeah, no, I love it. Um, and you know, uh, it's it's constantly something you're working on. You know, you, you know, eventually when you have a, a grumpy horse or an upper level horse that understands that feeling, um, you can sort of pick up the reins and say, okay, this is this is what I want. But as you're developing horses through the levels, um, you know, that's what you're working on is that connection. Yeah, so. sometimes you want a little bit more. Sometimes mm-hmm. you want a little bit less. You know, they're always that's something you're always looking at and saying, okay, how much how much pressure do you have on your hand now? You know, how much now right. and 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 this movement needs you know a little more go and a little bit more pressure. I mean, obviously, in the extended gates, you know that that the horses can take quite a strong hold in that. I mean, 
it's not always ideal, but that's just something that happens and you develop in your training. And it's not, not necessarily something to worry about when, when the horse, you know, uh, when you ask for extended trot and the horse takes a hold of the bit a little bit and, and you get pulled along, that can happen. So you're constantly developing it, changing the balance, working on con- contact is such a huge thing. We could talk mm-hmm. about it for weeks. So, yeah. um, you know, it's great that we get questions about it and about, you know, bit placement, saddle stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is uh, great stuff, great feedback from our from our yes, listeners for us to, to have talk, topics to talk about and, and things to uh, bring on the show. Exactly. Uh, and please keep our listener emails and Facebook shout outs. We really try to answer them online um, or on air. And um, if we can't answer them, Philip and I ourselves, we will find somebody that can. So thanks for, thanks for writing in. And you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is Maple Crest Farm KY, and my email is Reese at HorseRadioNetwork.com. You can find me at PhilipParksEquestrian.com, and my email is Philip at HorseRadioNetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors for allowing us to, to put on a great show, and don't t- forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at HorseRadioNetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.